Hey everyone, welcome. Today with me is Vicki Saunders, the founder of SheEO, who is transforming how women can accelerate their businesses. We originally met in um, Toronto with our mutual friend, Michelle, who is the founder of Nudie Batuti, who I've done an interview on this platform with as well. So if you want to check that out, make sure to look up the interview with Nudie Batuti. She was on um, a Dragon's Den. Is that what it is in your wow. area? Yeah. And um, she had quite a story that went along with that for her brand. And now she's got lots of exciting things ahead. Uh, but for today, we're going to focus on CEO so everyone can understand what this organization is and how they can benefit from it because it's huge. Uh, so first, welcome, Vicki. I'm so glad you took time out of your day to join us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Now, we have tons of female entrepreneurs uh, that are following and listening and um, are always struggling with the, the problem that you're trying to solve, which, as you know, is not having enough financial resources. And so give us a little background before CEO, what were you doing? And then how you have created to where you are today. Uh, so everyone understands the journey and the true empathy that you felt that created this, not just company, but true movement. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started a lot of different companies and initiatives and programs. And, um, I, you know, I personally have had a ton of experience witnessing how hard it is to be funded as a female entrepreneur. Uh, but not even just the funding, like the funding is a huge part of it, but there's also the way women run businesses and being funded on my own terms and supported on my own terms has been a big issue. And uh, back in 1999, I had a fund to invest in female entrepreneurs, well, in, in entrepreneurs generally. And out of the first 400 applications, only three came from women. That was in 1999. So literally I've witnessed this, for the last 20 something years and it makes me completely crazy as I'm sure it makes lots of people here. Like it, literally the numbers have not changed for decades. Uh, despite the fact that we have so much data showing how women get to market or uh, get to profitability more quickly than their male counterparts, they're more capital efficient. These are all good things in my perspective, but in the current weird world that we live in, which is super upside down, these are considered bad things. You're supposed to spend as much money as possible, win the whole market, winner takes all. Uh, I don't think that's how most women run businesses. And so I sort of stepped back and thought, if we were starting over again, like not trying to fit into the existing world, but if we were starting again, because all of this is just made up, it's not necessarily the right way to do things, how would you do it differently? And I looked at all the challenges that uh, that we all face. And so it's not just money, but it's networks, it's access to cut customers, access to expertise, and so we literally redesigned this from the bottom up. So the idea is 500 women come together and contribute $1,000 each into a pool of capital that's shared. We, all, we go online, we look at the applications that came in, and we vote on five companies. And those five companies get $100,000 roughly, 0% interest loan each, which they pay back over five years into the fund. And then the money's loaned out again. So we're creating this perpetual fund that just continues to pay forward. And the goal is to get to a million women as soon as possible. That's a billion dollar pool of capital funding 10,000 female entrepreneurs every year. And it's not just the money, like a 0% interest loan is pretty wicked, uh, obviously. But what you really do get, uh, each cohort gets 500 women on their team. So what do you need? You need us as customers. You need us to talk about you to our friends, marketing. Uh, you, you need introductions to... Um, uh, different customers, et cetera. Like we're there to help you. What do you need to grow? And this is uh, going to happen in thousands of regions around the world. And we're going to connect it all together. So if you're in New York and you get selected or San Francisco or Colorado, and you want to go to Mumbai or Auckland or Toronto with your business, you plug into the radically generous women in each of those markets to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, the mentoring is a huge part of this program as well. I know that you feel very convicted about that because all of these women in this pool have such different talents, resources. So you're bringing this huge collective movement together to truly accelerate the success of all these women. And one thing I want to let everyone know, uh, the thing that I found out about Vicky when I met her, we were at a coffee shop in Toronto and it was a Saturday or Sunday morning and her energy is authentic and real. And she's very, uh, in her leadership and very conscious. 
And so everything she's doing is very conscious of how do we accelerate growth collectively. And one of the things that you said that I think is so important is just because it's always been done a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way. And I, I'm sure you have, and I know some people listening have witnessed what's going on in Silicon Valley right now around the venture capital space and uh, the, all the harassment issues that are coming to surface for women who are trying to raise capital in a place where it was very male dominated and manipulated. And so now I'm so happy it's coming to light so that this conversation is on the table for what a lot of female entrepreneurs already knew, many afraid to say, um, but you're giving an option to, to not only um, have this collective of, um, knowledge and resources, including finances, but also a place to feel safe. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really huge part here. So we call this radical generosity. So everybody who contributes capital is not getting their money back, which is kind of, you know, if you're thinking of it, how is that investing? You know, we call you an activator in our network. You're activating your capital and your expertise and all these other forms besides money. Uh, but it's very, very important. I think we live in a, um, a highly unforgiving business environment. It's very difficult. And it's not surprising to me that this isn't working for women in the world the way things are, because we didn't design it. We right. were not there at the table to create this world. So shockingly, it's not really working for us. And so what if we were redesigning it? And so one of the things that we've witnessed is as the companies get selected into our network and they're validated by 500 women who vote for them, and it, that sort of brings this level of confidence. And then we create the safe space to ask for help each month. And we're showing up in a radically generous spirit. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason to do that is I imagine, like, how would you act differently or dream differently if you thought you were surrounded by radically generous people, as opposed to the second you made a mistake, someone was going to hammer you and take over your company. You know, you miss a milestone, we're taking another percent. So I, I'm very interested to witness over time what that kind of a different spirit creates in terms of business success and women, you know, dreaming more boldly and kind of going out there. I've noticed it myself. I'm, I'm a different person than I was two years ago when I start thinking like, what's the radically generous response? Do people perform better? and uh you know get to a different level of potential if if you're kinder like yeah. kind, you know like that's <laughs> it's like a giant experiment shocking <laughs> absolutely well everyone's responding to this i don't know if you're seeing uh the comments but that whole thought process of radical generosity and just because it was done this way doesn't mean it has to continue to be done that way uh and so that's really hitting people at a core. And I'm sure you've seen that over and over again. And, you know, my TED talk was about enlightened leadership, really calling out the way that it's been done isn't necessarily the right way to do it. And this intimidating fear uh, type of leadership that's abusive, in my opinion, uh, does not the best out of people. It might short term out of fear, but not long term in the potential. And so this uh, radical generosity, this more conscious approach to leadership and support, you're witnessing is truly getting uh, remarkable results, not just at the company's bottom line and growth, but the person's growth too. And, and I think a lot of people forget that. You become an entrepreneur to really maximize your potential and express yourself um, as your uniqueness and, and, and the way you want to be expressed. And a lot of people forget that and then get caught up in how it's been done or what everybody else is doing, that then all of a sudden they lose themselves in the process, which was all part of the journey anyway. Totally. I mean, I, you know, there's a couple of uh, entrepreneurs in our network that have been selected who are inventors and neither of them have, you know, went to business school or have a deep business background. And in our traditional world, we pick away at, at especially women. Like, I don't think we do this as much to men, but you know, the first thing is, oh, she doesn't know anything about business. I'm like, that's an easy thing to hire. Like right. you go hire an operations person. She invented something unbelievable. Like, hello, that's what's the value here, right? And then you can surround yourself with other things. And so I think that's a different way that we look at this. Someone invented, a, like reinvented the walker in the wheelchair. It's called the Alinker. A L I N K E R. Um, and, you know, in a traditional sort of funding process, she'd be taken out at the second round. Like she gets some seed funding, get it to market, and someone else is like, you don't know anything about how to scale this thing, so we're going to put in a dude. 
you know, who knows how to do this, who's looked in the traditional thing. She's like, I want to reinvent this whole thing. This is a vehicle for social change. And so she's only accepting investors who are interested in her new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's been hard as a female entrepreneur with an innovation out there to, to stand that ground because there's not a lot of money out there. But as soon as we get to some kind of scale and women have a choice on what kind of investors to pick, it's going to be interesting to see how fast the VCs start to change the way they do things because they're not going to get good pipeline. They're not going to get the best companies coming to them when there's an alternative out there. Agreed. I mean, I know I turned down, uh, it wasn't venture capital dollars, but it was definitely angel dollars when I launched the Butler bag for fear that I was going to be overpowered in, in how um, maybe more masculine old paradigm business would be done versus how I wanted to do it. Uh, which was really storytelling and, and storytelling to a bunch of moms who were feeling the same overwhelming feeling that I was feeling at that time period. That storytelling strategy uh, was so emotionally connecting that that's what accelerated the growth of the company versus the old way of doing it and just sticking it on short store shelves. And it, it had a huge difference and a huge impact. So you talked about the woman who is changing are innovating in the wheelchair walker space. I know, and just going through the website, and every time you send out a newsletter and I look at the new companies, there's some really cool companies in your pipeline that I would love to just give a shout out to. Sure. Uh, so everyone on here looking can, can check them out and see because there really are some very interesting, you're attracting some really incredible people in your organization. Definitely. So, I mean, one example. So I mentioned the Alinker, mm -hmm. uh, which you can go look at the Alinker.com. Another is Abego, A-B-E-E-G-O. And this is breathable food wrap. So all of our food wrap is toxic and plastic. And as soon as you wrap something, it starts to die, right? So you wrap an avocado, it turns brown immediately. Mm -hmm. But food is meant to breathe. So she has created this food wrap, which is made out of beeswax, jojoba oil, etc. And when you wrap an avocado, it stays green for four days. It's amazing. So like that this is amazing because I love avocados and I always feel pressure to eat the whole thing immediately. I know, totally. <laughs> I want it because it goes bad within minutes. You know, I actually heard about this, this woman, not from you and your organization, actually in some media that she was covered in um, because it was such a great story. And I remember thinking like, this is so amazing. She should be on the store shelves of every Whole Foods that exists right now. Absolutely. Right. And so she went to, you know, traditional investors and they're like, you're going to take on Saran Wrap. Good luck with that. You know, whereas every woman we put that in front of is like, oh my God, where do I buy it? It's reusable. It lasts 18 months. You wash it like amazing. So well, that's, that's another one. Sense, right. That's like, wait, so Sarah Blakely went up against. Hate. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And for Sarah very well. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, what we're also leveraging here, because the, the women who contribute capital are also voting on the companies they care most about. You know, our first question is, would you buy or recommend this product or service? So we're leveraging our buying power and we make 85 percent of purchasing decisions right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another company is called Magnus Mode, and it is an app for people that are on the autism spectrum to live more independently. And this right. is a really cool model. So literally how to take the subway, how to um, order a coffee, how to use an ATM. It's like step by step by step. So they have an app to allow them to do that and go off on their own as opposed to have someone supporting them all the time. Uh, and she, her business model is having companies sponsor each of these card decks essentially for people. And there's a massive global market for that. Uh, another one. So I just want to share the website with everybody. Uh, Magnus, M-A-G-N-U-S, mode.com, Magnus Mode. So I'm imagining the woman that created this has a child or someone that she cares she about. She has a brother. Yeah, so she's quite young. She has a, a brother who was on the autism spectrum, and she was super worried when she went off to university, having like helped him along and been with him. How I don't want him to just sit on the couch. Uh, you know, and how, how could I solve for that? So she created this app around it, which is just totally taking off, which is amazing. Okay. Um, there's just, so we have uh, companies that are in the education space. So 21toys.com, 21toys.com. And she, this is a really interesting one too. Again, all based on empathy, which you mentioned earlier. How, like, how do we teach empathy? How do we get people to understand what it's like in someone else's shoes? And so Alana uh, did this as a thesis project. She created this game and her whole thing is toys are the new textbooks. It needs to be experiential. 
Yep. And um, and so you get blindfolded. You have to give instructions to someone else to build something. You can't. They can't see. It's like a really kind of amazing experience. And that is now in 19 countries around the world being spread through our network uh, because it's just such a powerful kind of um, game slash you know new way of doing education around empathy, which I think women like really really understand. Yes. So yeah, so we go from health to a, we have an AI company called heartbeatai.com and it's it does sentiment analysis, uh, really understanding your customer or your stakeholders. Uh, and so with CEO, we ask everybody who contributes $1100 to to send us a statement as to why they're in. And so we put all of our I'm in statements through her technology and it came back and said that 68% of people give to CEO to support female entrepreneurs because of joy. Mm -hmm. And it had like 15 different kinds of joy. It's like really interesting. Uh, so again, like full spectrum from AI to health, to education, to food, uh, all kinds of different companies. You know, um, one other thing, and this is not as conscious um, as all the other things that we're talking about, but it's definitely um, important is when you become an investor in CEO, you actually can say you're an investor in women owned companies. And that as a female entrepreneur an existing business woman really does elevate your cachet and your uh, perceived ability to understand how to scale companies. So from a, from a bio standpoint, it really does help give you some elevated vis visibility and credibility. Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, when you become an activator in our network, so you're selecting the companies, a lot of people are like, I wouldn't know how to select a company. And I'm like, nobody knows how to select a company. <laughs> you know, we're, we have no idea how to do due diligence out there. We still have huge failure rates. And so my thing is we trust the intuition of 500 women over five experts in a room. I would do that any day, right? Yeah. Especially when we put our buying power to that. Uh, but if this whole thing is designed as an experience. If you come in and you contribute your capital giving before you receive uh, and you start to help these companies, what's happening in our network is the radically generous women who are showing up are now helping each other. We're becoming each other's customers and marketers and supporters. And it's creating this really kind of tight sort of sisterhood, essentially, uh, wanting to find those innovative companies, wanting to reach our potential being radically generous with each other is something I didn't really anticipate. I thought it would just be, you know, you contribute your thousand dollars and you're like, good luck with your company. And I can, I'll look each month to see if I can help you. But women are getting much more engaged with each other and wanting to do more. Yeah, I could totally see that because when you're in that activator role and you're helping people see progress and, and they're really receiving it and they're also grateful for it, which I know you create the environment for that. Um, it brings that joy that they were seeking to begin with, which puts them in alignment for all the other things that they're trying to accomplish outside of that mentorship role uh, in working with CEO and the, the organization. And I think that that conversation is becoming so much more relevant um, where spirituality is becoming uh, so much more common and you know, more people are doing yoga. I mean, back in 1999, when I was teaching yoga, people were like, what is that woo woo crazy stuff? Yeah. And while many people enter yoga as a sense of a workout, there's being there's a lot of um, consciousness being dripped into those classes. So I see this huge wave of awareness that's happening and people are stepping into business a lot more conscious and trying to be in alignment. And one of my last interviews was with this girl, Brittany, who is also from Toronto. And um we were talking about hustle versus flow and that old energy of push, push, push versus being centered and being aligned and then flowing with what's showing up, which to a lot of people that are still stuck in that old ego mindset sounds very lazy. Um, and they think, oh, what are you just gonna sit on the couch all day and just hope everything appears? where it's really about a shift of inspired action and you're still taking action, but it's inspired action. It's more aligned action and it's not forcing something, but allowing something is very different. And that's where that joy really happens and transpires. And so speaking of joy, I watched the video of the conference that you recently had in Toronto and there was over 500 women and I could see it was massive energy, which I was like, God, I wish I had gone. It, it just seemed so amazing. So um, can you tell us a little bit about that conference and what you were 
maybe two things that you are most surprised about that even in all this thought that you put into it that came out of it that you were like, wow, I'm doing something amazing. Yeah, I'm always really uh, overwhelmed at, by what happens when you hold the space at, for people to step into what it is that they want to do, right? And so we we do this thing called practicing radical generosity. And for we had 500 women in that space, which was amazing. Uh, all either entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs or scaling their businesses. And we did open mic and you come up to the mic for 15 seconds and you ask for what you need from the audience. And just, you know, I'm like, assume that whatever you need is in this room. And people would come up to the mic and we did this all through tracking in a Google doc. Uh, what is your ask? And someone said, I'm, you know, I need some help with this business that I'm building. And, you know, 10 hands go up and then people type their name in the Google doc. And in one hour, we had 110 women come up to the microphone and ask for help and 350 helped. So put their email addresses into the Google Doc. So you could literally see it happening and it was, and it's kind of magical, right? Where you're like, uh, you ask for help and you're like, oh, this won't be here, but I'll try. And then someone's like, I can help you, I can help you, I can help you. And then you kind of go around. I could think one of the things I, I, I'm so surprised by and I keep realizing we literally have everything we need around us. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is ask. And so the second surprise to me always is, how much we stop ourselves from asking. My stuff, you know, this is probably a dumb question. I should probably already know this. No one really wants to help me. It, I'll be a burden. Like all these voices we have in our head. And part of the thing that I am um, consciously like really working on creating a space for is if you don't ask for help, you're robbing someone else in the room who has something to give from giving, you know, doing it. And so I often use the example just of myself. I have a pretty big network on LinkedIn. And everybody owes me a favor. And I'm sure you have a huge network like this. Right? I'm like, I'm never going to be able to use all these favors. So like, please ask me to connect you to someone in my network so those favors get used. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so it's a two-way street. It's like, don't just think you're bugging me. I actually really want to help. This is what I'm good at, right? And so uh, understanding that giving and receiving is this muscle. It's this circular flow. And if you're just giving without receiving, you're blocking half of what's possible and you're always yeah. out of breath and thinking you're in scarcity. But if yeah. you can get into flow of giving and receiving, you'll just be blown away by how much is around you. Yeah, and you hit on something that was so huge for me in my own transformation, my ability to, to get to a higher place than I, than I was, um, a higher frequency than I was, is I was taught when I was a kid that asking for help was very weak. Hmm. And it's embarrassing and you should be ashamed of yourself. And that was coming from a dad in the military, you know, back in the 40s and 50s. And um, I, I wasn't in the 40s and 50s, but that's <laughs> where that mindset was ingrained. And, um, and so it was really, really hard for me to ever ask for help. And one of my mentors said pretty much exactly what you said one day. They said, how does it feel for you? to help somebody else, Jen. And I said, I love it. It feels amazing. Like I love connecting people. I love solving people's problems. I love giving to people. That makes, that brings me more joy than getting something. And they said to me, then why would you rob somebody else of the same joy? And it was a huge game changer for me to feel more comfortable and not ashamed and more confident in asking for help. I still struggle with it. I really do. I love giving more than I necessarily do like receiving, which which is also a huge problem in yeah. women, uh, growing abundance. And in our society, you know, I've been watching these statistics over time. And back when I was speaking at Make Mine a Million um, a decade ago, women were uh, starting in the United States two to one businesses to men. And then it, it went up almost to three and a half to one businesses to men in the US today, 10 years later. Back then, women were creating less than 1% of the wealth in the US, and now it's only 3%. So how is that possible that all these women are starting on these businesses, yet they're only slowly gaining percentage and creating wealth? And I really truly believe, and I'm sure you have an opinion on this, um, I really truly believe it's this uh, subconscious belief still about women asking for help, women being more comfortable in giving than receiving, because receiving is a huge part of that flow. And then also this 
underlying belief that if I'm too successful, I'm not a good mom. If I'm too successful, I'm not a good wife. If I'm too successful, I'm not a good community service, a person of service. And so there's these underlying beliefs that I feel that women, we put the brakes on for fear of what everybody else is going to think of us based on these subconscious beliefs. So can you address that? Because I'm sure you see this every day. Yeah, I mean, I, this is a, this is cultural, right? So it's going to take a while to change. I think there's our narrative hasn't really caught up with our reality. So we have more money. Like the largest wealth transfer in history is happening right now, and seventy five percent of inherited wealth is going to women. We have money like we've never had before, but most of us act like we don't have enough money, and we're never going to have enough, right? And so we're so careful holding on. Yeah. Um, and then there's also this, you know, if you stand up out on stage, you'll be boastful, and we shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be like you know, talking about yourself that way. We're uncomfortable with women on stage and in power uh, in general in society, which is something that is starting to shift, but it's going to take time. And so I, you know, we've been brought up to be perfect. And so stepping into something without it being perfect, uh, you know, there's a whole issue around that. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, just in general, because it's been so hard to get funding, we tend to keep our businesses small. So 85% of businesses run by women are kept under a million dollars in revenue because yeah. it's just easier to do it and just keep it small. I don't have to talk to anybody else. I don't ask for any help. I can just do it myself with my head down. Uh, and yet, you know, that just leaves I mean, the vast, vast majority of us nowhere near our potential right? and creating the impact that we want to. And so again, I think creating this safe space for us to step a little bit farther forward, dream a little bit bigger and go, oh my gosh, I did it. And then what else? And then what else? And if we're there lifting each other up and supporting each other in that, you know, with a ton of different versions of success, not just one, like go big or go home, that's the world we're living in. It doesn't need to be what you do. But again, I, I really think that this space and the culture that we create and the values supporting this will allow us to reach much more of our potential. And it, it really starts with, you know, being kinder and nicer to each other. This concept of radical generosity for me. So, yeah. And you just hit on a huge activator in goal setting versus clarity to me, um, where you said, and what else and what else? And that's a very spiritual expansion question, right? So what else is possible? And I always get my clients to move from this goal setting with very clear convicted goals of how it has to happen to, what is it that you desire and why is it that you desire it? And then get more into an emotional state of it that, you know, I desire to make $200,000 a month. Let's just say that's the desire statement. Why is that important to you? So first you get the superficial right. answers, but then it's a, you can get into that real clear emotional state where you can feel their energy change where it's, I desire or a shift from the desire statement to, I love making $200,000 plus a month because I love buying my children clothes that they, they like. Or I love because I like to travel the world and bring my kids with me. I love it because I like to give back to my community. And so then this, these I love statements of already having this and being it changes their entire body language and their ability of what why it's possible. Uh, going from that judgment of the goals to this understanding of, oh, I'm gonna do good with this. I'm gonna help my family, I'm gonna help my community, I'm gonna help other and And I'm, it's one of the biggest shifts I'm seeing in all the women that I'm working with right now is getting them into that place. Uh, so I know you do a lot of mindset training. Uh, is this the first phase or are you doing it throughout? Yeah, so we have a series of mindset shifts that we think we need to take as a society and individually in order to get to this new, better world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of them obviously is moving from scarcity to abundance, right? We're moving from an economic model where everything's based on limited resources and we're moving to a place where we have abundance of resources. We're going to have unlimited energy, you know, unlimited information, et cetera. Uh, the mindset shifts are really challenging because we don't really have a model of what is the world that we want to go to. We know that this one's broken for sure. Uh, you know, five people have the same wealth as three and a half billion people. And that's a result of winner takes all. And so how do you go from that to a collective economy where more than one person can win? Yeah. Right. Like, how do you do that? Yeah. And, and so this is where I think, you know, women think quite a bit differently than men. Almost every venture that comes anywhere near us, uh, has their initial thing about like, it's about creating a better world and making money. 
it's not just ever about making money. That doesn't really fit within our approach. And so we're looking for businesses that benefit humanity. And I think that that is a massive positive differentiator right now. If you can actually tap into meaning for people and show where this is having a positive impact in society, you're likely to have customers that talk about you more, that are excited about uh, either working at your company or buying your products or services and marketing them to others. That's a big differentiator. And so I always say meaning is the new money. If you can yeah. figure out meaning. I love that. Money, meaning is yeah. the new money. Oh my gosh, I love it. If, if you can try that in. Yeah. <laughs> if you just buy that in, like you're going to be more successful. And so I, this is, I think for the first time in my life, you know, all the way through, it's felt a bit like a burden to be a woman in business in my personal experience over the last 30 years. And now I feel like I have a total competitive advantage. So I'm pumped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the way I look at things is we're, we need to move to a new place. And if you think a little bit differently than the norm, it, you're, you know, you have that advantage. And so if, if everyone's telling you that doesn't make sense, that's not how it works. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that completely. And it is a competitive advantage. Um, so I'm going to be really respectful of your time, even though I have things I would love to ask you. Um, but where can people who, number one, have a company that would like to get incubated with you, how would they get connected with you and get started? And then also for people who want to be activators, also known as investors, yep. uh, mentors, how would they get involved? Oh, Anna. You totally, my friend Anna just got on here. I'm thinking about her the entire time because her new venture is like perfect for, yes. your, so good. for your community. Yeah. Uh, so how does everyone get involved? And so venture applications, venture applications open for this year on August 10th. You can go to our website, sheeo.world, S-H-E-E-O.world. And you can apply. Our application is only 12 questions. It's very simple to fill out. No pitch decks, no attachments, no jargon. Uh, we've completely redesigned that process. And if you'd like to be an activator, you can go to our website, sheeo.world. And if you're in any of our markets, Canada, the US, New Zealand, or the Netherlands for this year, you can put your credit card in and become part of the network. And we have a whole online community where you can meet all of the other activators and start supporting each other. So simple. I love it. I cannot wait to see what happens. I know um, the event was just in Toronto, but you're really expanding. I, I know you reached out to me when you were coming to Philly. So yeah. where can other people expect to see you this year? Come the end of 2017 and going into 2018. Yeah. Going into 2018, we'll be probably in eight to 10 countries next year. We're doubling our size each year. So we're on track to reach the billion dollar fund in 2026, which is nine years from now. So that be when we get that billion dollar fund up, that's 10,000 female entrepreneurs funded every single year. So I just, I'm so excited to hit that number. I want us all to realize like we have everything that we need to change the world, everything. And a thousand bucks at a time, let's do it. Whatever it takes. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your advice, your passion. Um, I know there were some really good nuggets of wisdom for everyone here, and I'm sure everyone's going to be checking this out and getting involved on um, one way or another. And um, I'm excited for to see where it goes and it keeps expanding. So we'd love to have you back to track the success that continues. I'd love to come. Thanks for all you do. Hopefully I'll see you soon in Toronto. Okay, cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye.